Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. <laughs> Today we are going to be reading Matthew 7. So, as always, let us start off in prayer. Thank you, Lord, very much for everything that you've done for us. And as I'm recording this at the end of the Easter weekend, Lord, I just want to take a special moment to say thank you so much for coming and dying for us on the cross those beautiful, beautiful years ago, Lord God that you decided to make that sacrifice, Lord God, for us, that you decided to come and die for us so that we may live in and through you. We ask, Lord, that you would please enrich our minds, enrich our hearts, and enrich our spirits as we read through your word. Let us come closer to you and come closer to fulfilling what it is that you want from us, Lord God. Thank you. Amen. Right, Matthew 7. Don't judge so that you won't be judged. For with whatever judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with whatever measure you measure, it will be measured to you. And this is a very, very hard thing to do, because as humans, we are all very judgmental. We all tend to look at things and make quick snap judgments about things. And when we do that, we must remember that those same standards that we hold others to, we will be held to in return. So if we say something's not right and then we go ahead and do it ourselves, we're being very hypocritical and that is not right. And it's very difficult sometimes. It is, it is hard to live that life where you don't judge others and you don't see others as doing things wrong. And yeah, but I think the statement in modern times where don't judge me is used completely wrong because there's a difference between judgment and looking after your friend or your loved one. There's a difference between being judgmental and being caring because you know what they're doing is wrong. There's a big difference. Judgment is to pronounce a sentence. Whereas when you are uh, helping a friend out or helping a family member, you do it in love. There's a completely different aspect to that. And you don't take a superior position when you do it that way as well. It's very important to make that distinction between the two. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but don't consider the beam that is in your own eye? Oh, or how will you tell your brother? Let me remove the speck from your eye, and behold, the beam is in your eye. You hypocrite. First remove the beam out of your own eye so that you can see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. So I think it's very clear there the way that that do not judge is stated followed by the parable for better understanding and i think the parable is often left out of it when explaining it and it's very important first remove the beam out of your own eye so that you may see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye not that you don't try and help your brother by taking the speck out of the eye but make sure you are clean first and you are clear of all the things that are in your own way before you help others don't give that which is holy to the dogs Neither cast your pearls before the pigs, lest perhaps they trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you to pieces. Another very, very good verse there. You don't want to cast your pearls before the pigs, because whether it be your knowledge, your experience, your creations, if people don't understand them or don't respect you, they're going to turn against you and use those things against you. Rather, show it to people or give advice to the people that care about you or show your creations to people that will appreciate it and understand it so that you can be rewarded for that and they won't turn and trample you um ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and it will be open to you for everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened what man is there of you who if his son asks him for bread will give him a stone or if he asks for a fish will give him a serpent if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? And if you guys can hear some background sounds, it's busy raining in the mo at the moment, so the car is driving past and the water falling down and all of that adds to that, so sorry if it's a bit distracting. All right. Therefore, whatever you desire for men to do to you, you shall also do to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter in by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. How narrow is the gate, and restricted is the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Beware of false prophets, 
who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. By their fruits you will know them. Do you gather grapes from thorns, or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but the corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree can't bring forth evil fruit, and neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that doesn't grow good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now we see here from the Lord's Prayer as well, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What is it that we should always seek to be doing? We should always be, seek to be doing the Father's will on this earth. And what is the Father's will? Listen. <laughs> as we go through the scriptures, you'll see, because Jesus says later, He who has seen me has seen the Father. So look at Jesus and you'll discern the Father's will. Many will tell me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy by your name? By your name cast out demons, and by your name do mighty works. Then I will tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. So, as you see over there, what God desires with us is a relationship. He doesn't want you to go out and do things in his name just because you can and you think it's the right thing. No, he wants a relationship with you. He wants to know you and for you to know him. Everyone, therefore, who hears these words of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it didn't fall, for it was founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. It happened, when Jesus had finished saying these things, that the multitudes were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them with authority and not like the scribes. See, he was teaching from first-hand knowledge and first-hand experience. It's not to say what the scribes were teaching was wrong, but it was teaching from second-hand experience and second-hand knowledge. It's good to read the Bible. It's good to hear all of these things. Very good. But what you need is a relationship with God. What you need is that interaction and that interpersonal connection with God so that you can speak with authority. When he came down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Behold, a leper came to him and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you want to, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I want to be made clean. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Jesus said to him, See that you tell nobody, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to him. When he came into Capernaum, a centurion came to him, asking him, and saying, Lord, my servant lies in the house paralyzed, grievously tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority, having under myself soldiers. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Most assuredly, I tell you, I haven't found so great a faith, not even in Israel. I tell you that many will come from the east and from the west, and will sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That one sentence there, when Jesus heard it, he marveled. He marveled. That is quite something for the God of all creation to marvel at your faith. <laughs> Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, let it be done for you as you have believed. His servant was healed in that hour. I think the centurion and a certain person that comes later on in this book are a great testimony to the Gentiles that before the Jews were the chosen people and still are, but the Gentiles can have a faith greater than the Jews. And Jesus can marvel at the faith of a Gentile. So even if you haven't been born into a Christian family, or even if you haven't been born into the whole 
theology and way of thinking, it doesn't mean that you're any less. You're an adopted son, but that doesn't make you less. In fact, you can be more. You can make God marvel at you. And I think that's just such a beautiful look into the heart of God that even with us as adopted children, he doesn't see us any less. He still values us and appreciates us just as much. It doesn't matter where we've come from or the past that we've had. When Jesus came into Peter's house, sorry, it's just important that we are what he desires. <coughs> sorry. When Peter came, when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laying sick of a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her. She got up and served him. When evening came, they brought to him many possessed with demons. He cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying he took our infirmities and bore our diseases. Now, when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave the order to depart to the other side. A scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow wherever you go. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, allow me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. When he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. Behold, a great tempest arose in the sea, so much that the boat was covered with waves, but he was asleep. They came to him and woke him up, saying, Save us, Lord, we are dying. He said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he got up, rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was a great calm. The men marveled, saying, What kind of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? When he came to the other side, into the country of the Gurgensines, Two people, possessed with demons, met him there, coming forth out of the tombs exceedingly fierce, so that no man could pass by that way. Behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now there was a herd of many pigs feeding far away from them. The demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go into that herd of pigs. He said to them, Go. They came out and went into the herd of pigs, and behold, the whole herd of pigs rushed down the cliff into the sea and died in the water. Those who fed them fled and went away into the city and told everything, and what had happened to those who were possessed with demons. Behold, the, all the city came out to meet Jesus. When they saw him, they begged that he would depart from their borders. How often are we afraid of the moves of God? How often do things that Jesus does seem scary to us so that we will beg him to flee to to go away and, and leave so that we can just get back to our normal lives even when there is something like demons or demon possessed men in them we know that and we take comfort in the knowledge that we know it and understand it but when god doesn't move that we don't understand we are quick to say it's of the devil we don't want it here whereas he is moving, and that move is for our good and for our benefit. It's quite often the case that we can be scared falsely, have faith in the devil to do us wrong rather than God to do us good, which is not how we should behave. He entered into a boat and crossed over and came into his own city. Behold, they brought to him a man who was paralyzed, lying on a bed. Jesus, say, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, cheer up. Your sins are forgiven you. Behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man blasphemes. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the par paralytic, Get up and take your mat and go up to your house. He arose and departed to his house. When they, But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such authority to men. Judged by the fruits. The Pharisees and scribes were, sorry, the scribes were, Oh my gosh, this is so wrong. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But look at the fruits. What was the fruit of this action? They glorified God as a result. And I'd say that's a good fruit. As Jesus passed from there, 
he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax collection office. And by the way, this is the same Matthew that uh, is the name of this book, <laughs> Book of Matthew. He saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax collection office. He said to him, follow me. He got up and followed him. It happened as he sat at the table in the house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are healthy have no need for a physician, but those who are sick do. But you go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Then John's disciples came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples don't fast? Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of untrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch would tear away from the garment, and a worse hole is made. Neither do people put new wine into old wineskins, or else the skins would burst, and the wine would be spilled, and the skins ruined. No, they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. Very, very interesting here is that a lot of people will tell you to stay away from worldly things, to stay away from people of the world, and not to make friends with worldly people. What did Jesus do when he was on earth? Sure, he surrounded himself with a strong band of 12 fellows that he could trust and rely on until one betrayed him. <laughs> but uh, he also went out amongst the tax collectors, the sinners, the downtrodden, the downcast of society, those that everybody else just abandoned to their fate. And he made friends with them. He was there for them when nobody else wanted to be. That is Jesus' heart. While he told these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Moment of faith right there. Brilliant explanation of it. And to posit further on that previous statement that I made, it's very, very important that while you should make friends with worldly people, you should also have a strong Christian support structure behind you at the same time. Because it is tempting to join them in their ways. And to do that is folly and wrong. So you need to have a strong Christian support structure behind you while you do that as well. If you plan to do that. If that is what God puts on your heart. Jesus got up and followed him as did his disciples. Behold, a woman who had an issue of blood for twelve years came behind him and touched the tassels of his garment. For she said within herself, If I just touch his garment, I will be made well. But Jesus, turning around and seeing her, said, Daughter, cheer up, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder, he said to them, Make room, because the young lady isn't dead, but sleeping. They were ridiculing him. But when the crowd was put out, he entered in, took her by the hand, and the young lady arose. The report of this went forth into all that land. As Jesus passed by from there, two blind men followed him, calling out and saying, Have mercy on us, son of David! When he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They told him, Yes, Lord. He touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. Their eyes were opened. Jesus strictly charged them, saying, See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread abroad his fame in all that land. As they went forth, behold, there was brought unto him a mute man who was demon-possessed. When the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke. The multitudes marveled, saying, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, By the prince of demons he casts out demons. Jesus went about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered as sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, 
The harvest is indeed plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into his harvest. And I pray, dear people that are watching this, that you may be one of those laborers that will go forth into the field and harvest for the Lord. I pray that God will be with you, and I pray blessing upon you. Thank you very much for watching. As always, my name is Athais. Good night and God bless. Bye for now.